We are live, sir. Okay. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we welcome you all for our monthly uh, meeting of uh, Indian Arthroscopy Society Academic Corner. This is July month. And uh, we have a eminent speaker. And uh, there are two case presentations. Uh, uh, one from uh, Ganga Hospital, one from Dr. Praglad. And uh, we have uh, two moderators. Today we have Raghavir from Hyderabad. He doesn't need uh, any introduction. He is a known national and international faculty. And uh, he was the, uh, he, he conducted an IAS con. Uh, so all of you know about uh, Dr. Raghavir uh, the work. And we have an, another young uh, uh, EC member of uh, Indian Arthroscopy Society, Dr. Chirag from Bangalore. And uh, both of them are going to moderate this, moderate this, this session. I request uh, Raghavir and Chirag take over and introduce the speaker also, Dr. Ram Chidambaram who is the past president of uh, SESI and is a well-known international faculty. Uh, dear Raghu, please take over. Thank you. Unmute Raghavir. Good evening, everyone. I thank you for the invitation. Ram is a well-known figure, known nationally and internationally. And he was the past president of the Shore Railway Society. And, uh, and he is uh, very active in the BIS. I invite Ram to come uh, and uh, do this lecture on the first time this operation. So, Ram, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Raghavi, for the kind introduction. Uh, let me just share my pres presentation. Uh, Okay. Can you see it? Yes, Ram. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Sundar, uh, Raghavir, uh, Chirag, and entire Indian Autoscopy Society, Office Bearers, for the kind invitation uh, to uh, talk about first time uh, shoulder dislocation. Let me just minimize this. Okay. So this is my uh, current affiliation. Shoulder dislocation is the most common joint to dislocate, 97% anterior, and 50% of them occur between the ages of 15 to 30 years. What we are talking about, whom we are talking about, acute traumatic anterior dislocation in a young patient less than 25 years. We are not talking about the elderly patients at all. And the questions are, what's the problem? To fix or not to fix? If fix, what surgery? If not to fix, what conservative? What do you recommend here? Yes, of course, it's a knee x-ray. Uh, uh, some noises here in the background. Okay. So you will all jump to say he needs an ACL reconstruction. Why? There is a risk of re-injury, joint damage, functional loss. Now, my question is, why not we respect shoulder? You see the IGHL or inferior glenohumeral ligament along with the hammock function support the shoulder, support the humeral head, and this gets torn. Why do we not address this when it is torn the first time? Example of 18 year old swimmer student fell down from bike and coming to us with the first time dislocation of the shoulder. What do we do? Reduce the dislocation, put a sling or support or immobilizer and mobilize and consider surgery only if it is recurrent. This was the traditional approach. Why do we need to still follow this? I got an MRI for this patient. As you see, it shows an extensive labral tear, what we call as the ulpsa lesion, anterior labroperiosteal sleeve avulsion, which is extremely unstable uh, clinical uh, condition. So why do we need to uh, let that uh, uh, dislocate again and again? There were two options. Number one, non-operative. Number two, surgery. The proponent of uh, uh, non-operative uh, treatment, they use either some sort of strapping, sling, or abduction brace, or a neutral rotation brace, which was popularized by Itoy in 1999, which showing cadaveric studies, uh, showing good coaptation of the labrum to the uh, 
glenoid. He also showed, confirmed this with MRI study, and also a clinical study to show a significant difference of 30% in the internal rotation group, whereas 0% in the external rotation group. But the market was flooded with the external rotation braces. In fact, we did one study in uh, UK, but the study was discontinued because of uh, non-compliance. Patients did not want to wear this external rotation brace as cumbersome. And also, if you look at it, Itoy later paper, 198 patients showed good significant difference in the recurrence rate, but this result is not translated across the world. It's a study from Norway showing no difference in the recurrence rate between the two type of brace immobilization, as well as studies from Canada and Israel do not show a difference. The incidence of recurrence is similar. So what do you do non-operative is your choice, but uh, external rotation brace is not necessary. Now coming to the point, what will happen when you leave the shoulder to recur? Progressively, the ligamentous tear continues, the capsule gets stretched, the tissue become uh, poor, the patient gets discomfort due to repeated dislocation, and also each dislocation, you incur more and more glenoid or humeral head bone loss. And there is also risk of arthritis. So why do we need to do this? I am a proponent of advocating surgery for a first-time dislocator. What are my uh, supporting factors? Why, why do I want to fix early? Number one, reduce the recurrence rate, thereby also improving the function and quality of life, especially return to sports. Only two factors decide recurrence. Number one, age. If the age is less than 25 per years, the chance of recurrence with conservative treatment is 80 to 90%. And second is activity, either sports or a higher demand on the shoulder. There is no doubt this has been proved from multiple studies. These were earlier studies on first-time dislocation showing the difference between conservative and surgical treatment. In fact, a randomized study way back in 2007 comparing uh, open surgery with conservative showed a significant difference of 9% recurrence versus 62% recurrence with conservative is level one evidence. Early stabilization improves function. This proved by a study from Robinson et al. comparing orthoscopic stabilization versus lavage reduced recurrence rate by 76%. And non-randomized prospective trial. This is mostly possible in this scenario because you have to explain the condition, uh, discuss with the patient, then randomize is very difficult. So prospective studies are only non-randomized in this particular scenario, mostly. So you see a difference of recurrence rate of 13% versus 71% and a higher return to sports with orthoscopic treatment. Now, if you want to quote a robust meta-analysis and a systematic review, here you go. At 2020, meta-analysis, 10 studies, prospective, 569 patients show a seven-fold decrease in recurrence. The recurrence with orthoscopic treatment is 9.7% compared to 67% with conservative treatment. And the need for surgical intervention is dramatically less with orthoscopic treatment with a higher return to sports. So what to do in my practice, in a young patient, sportive, I say you have a 90% failure rate with conservative, which I could change to a 90% success rate with offering orthoscopic surgery, easier. Also other reasons, uh, if you fix early, you improve the proprioception, why? Because the normal mechano receptors uh, for the shoulder is lying in the inferior capsule and the ligament and labrum complex. Why do you get this structure to get attenuated, uh, get uh, uh, poor, rather than restoring it at the time when it is gone and get the full proprioception of the joint, especially it is important for a overhead OP player. Important point, reducing uh, the risk of arthritis. Repeated dislocation is the number one cause of uh, damaging the glenoid as well as humeral head. More the number of dislocation, more glenoid loss. This has been proved by uh, studies as well as it is common sense. These are the risk factors for arthritis. Age at primary dislocation, number of dislocation, a bony glenoid remulation and the high energy sports. If you look at it, the number of dislocation, the fact that we can improve on it by operating on them earlier if we think the risk is higher. In fact, surgery does reduce the risk of arthritis can up to 33%. And lastly, that there is minimal risk of surgery, and, but more benefit. Why this? 
because 20 years ago, for example, in India, the surgery for recurrent dislocator was a putty plaque surgery, which can result in stiffness and suboptimal function. But now we are talking about a, a high-tech surgery like this, an arthroscopic stabilization surgery. What we do is a bank out repair and also sometimes the posterior inferior labral repair to lift up the hammock tissue. Usually use three to a minimum three anchors to do a capsulolabral plication repair, recreate the bumper effect, which can give a robust repair so that we can start to rehab early. The patient can even start moving the shoulder the day after surgery. I have been doing orthoscopic stabilization for 20 years. I did start with metallic anchor, screwing type anchor, biosubable P anchor, but we no longer use this uh, uh, product. Uh, it's the current practice for the last six, seven years in my practice, at least we are using all suture anchor, means stitch on stitch, leaving no metal or peak or uh, residue in the bone even. The risk of arthroscopic surgery, shoulder arthroscopic surgery in the hands of an expert uh, is very low, less than 1%, meaning uh, like transient paresthesia or stitch abscess or low grade infection, less than 1%. Stiffness is very rare after instability surgery, but the benefits are many. It's an anatomical repair of the torn labrum to the socket, preserving the range of movement from day one. Over 90% chance of no dislocation, no discomfort, no limitation to the patient restoring the proprioception in the native joint and reducing the risk of future arthritis and perhaps bone loss. Sometimes we can say that, okay, let the patient can recur and we come back and do a surgery. But if you do a later surgery for a bone loss, it may be like a, a, a lethargy or bone graft reconstruction that could be non-anatomical procedure. When you do first go, it is an anatomical repair. So let me show a few cases. A 23-year-old man with acute dislocation after badminton injury. You could see that, as I explained to you before, it is a high-grade lesion, uh, Alpsa lesion with avulsion of the uh, uh, labroperiosteal sleeve. As you see here, arthroscopy, you could see a juicy labral tear, which has come off the uh, socket. And as you follow the rest of the humeral head, there is no heel sac lesion. There is some impaction, but there is no dent because repeated dislocation only makes the uh, uh, humeral head more and more impacted, uh, sunking in. So here I did the posterior inferior labrum from the posterior root, restore the inferior hammock, and proceed to anterior labral repair with the three uh, anchors, especially mainly the key uh, area is from three to six o'clock position to restore the hammock of IGHL attachment a stable repair, humeral head centered over the glenoid. And here is the patient uh, allowing early mobilization from day two post-operative, achieving full range of movement practically around four to six weeks time, strengthening program for the third month, achieving a good range of uh, movement, including external rotation with no uh, clinical limitation. And you can go for progressive sports training. Uh, next case, a 22-year-old first-time traumatic dislocation uh, following road traffic accident. Here is the uh, MRI. I could, I, you could see the displaced labral uh, tear, which is obvious with the hemarthrosis. In fact, a MRI, a MRI performed within a few days of uh, injury. It looks like actually MR orthogram because of the joint hemarthrosis. As you see here, you could also notice uh, evidence of a slap lesion, like superior labrum uh, tear and fluid around the biceps. This is at Scopy. You could see this is the superior labrum along with the biceps with the extensive uh, bucket handle type of labral, superior labral tear in association with the bank uh, tear, which is the anterior labral tear extending from uh, two o'clock to six o'clock. So if you leave the shoulder to dislocate again, this particular lesion is not repairable. So here I have done a repair of a bucket handle type of tear with a, a anchor with the posterior simple suture, and then proceed to go to the anterior labral repair subsequently with restoring the in, uh, anterior inferior hammock, and finally put an extra PDS suture to complete the uh, bucket handle type of repair. So this is the final repair being done. And that is him at the three months post-operative, achieving full range uh, movement of the uh, shoulder and a good uh, rotation as well. This is his MRI follow-up at one year. He could see practically the location of the anchors, as are all suture anchors, and a good robust repair of the labrum and superior labrum. Uh, another case uh, is a young man after dislocation, 
if you see uh, the uh, CT scan showing a marginal glenoid fracture, very important. This is a subset of patients. They do very well with uh, offering early surgery, uh, especially when the glenoid marginal fragment is displaced. If it is displaced, if you leave them to recurrently dislocate, they go for more attritional glenoid bone loss and mostly ending up in having a non-anatomical reconstruction later on. So beware. So this is the patient with the displaced marginal glenoid. Uh, we could uh, deal that arthroscopically, uh, possible to uh, repair. I think you could, uh, sorry. You could see that is the avulsed glenoid fragment with the attachment of the superior and inferior uh, ligament tissue of IGHL attachment. So you could restore that when it is broken, easy. So there we have uh, repaired this uh, uh, glenoid bony bancot lesion with the superior and inferior anchor to lift the uh, fragment and go in a position against the raw area uh, to make it heal. Sometimes we could do a double row depending on the size of the fragment. So that is the complete repair. And that's how it looks like at the end. So that is the patient that three month orthoscopic repair uh, showing a well-centered humeral head against the glenoid. So finally, uh, what did I do for this patient? Uh, first, I shown an 18-year-old uh, swimmer uh, with the Alps lesion. I repaired orthoscopically, and here he is at five weeks post-operative. Uh, down, very good. Sideways, up, both shoulders. And that is a range of movement down. at five weeks uh, post-operative. Okay. This is possible if you do early intervention. Uh, to summarize, I would like to uh, quote this uh, uh, paper, good article from uh, BEST, British Elbow Shoulder and so Elbow Shoulder Society, uh, combined British Orthopedic Association uh, Clinical Patient Care Pathway for Traumatic Anterior Shoulder Instability, uh, published in 2015, uh, going through all the published evidence uh, so far and achieving the summary. Uh, it says, number one, about the role of uh, external rotation brace. Um, well, it's no additional benefit over simple immobilization in a sling. And secondly, about the first time dislocator, it says age less than 25, uh, clinical examination, risk assessment, and shared decision-making by shoulder surgeon. And also I get a diagnostic specialist imaging, that is MRI scan in my practice, and offer an orthoscopic anatomical repair as there are evidence to support primary orthoscopic bank out repair. Uh, works well, particularly in those young patients who are involved in contact sports or occupation that involves overhead activities. So as my summary, uh, first time traumatic shoulder dislocation, age less than 25 years, patient very active in sports or having a high demand on the shoulder with extensive labral lesion, tear or marginal glenoid fracture. Uh, you have to counsel them early surgery as a successful option with, of course, the pros and cons of both conservative as well as operative management with the risk involved with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ram. Unshare your screen. Unshare your screen. Yeah, uh, uh, can I ask you a question? Yes, yes, on that. Uh, so, okay, say, so, Ram, then in your practice, uh, do you do MRI in all your custom dislocation? irrespective of age, not only less than 25 years, more than 25 years also, less active patients. I, I do. Uh, the awfully off the patient come with an MRI, but they remain, <laughs> <laughs> or most of them really, that's the practice in India, in my uh, area uh, and the pra practice pattern. Uh, but in most of the patients, I like to have an MRI because there are advantages. Number one, it shows the amount of damage. Uh, there is no, see, in fact, Baker, Baker et al. Uh, in 1990 uh, did a microscopic evaluation of this uh, uh, labral tear in first time dislocator and classified into three types. Type 1, uh, around 10% uh, something, uh, only capsular injury, no labral tear. Type 2, he has got a capsular injury, partial labral tear. And type 3, which is around 65%, a big labral tear with capsular tear. He classified that. And then on that basis, we later classified that, okay, this is the high grade injuries that can likely may be going for a repeated dislocation. So if you do an MRI, you may be able to pick up those Alpsa lesion and marginal glenoid fracture from day one. Yes, agree. 
Raghavir, you are the boss. <laughs> you no need to raise the hand. Hmm. <laughs> Ram, so once you decide, how early you want to go for do stabilization? Um, it depends on the patient. In, in our, sorry, it's echoing. Huh? I would like to go around between five to seven days uh, is earlier. Not very immediately because there will be fluid, uh, there will be fluid extravasation with arthroscopy if we do very early. So around one week to ten days is the ideal time. Uh, uh, Ram sir, a question from me. Uh, not yet completed. So in some cases of uh, shoulder dislocations, some people go for stiffness, like arthrofibrosis picture, some patients. So if they, if they come... How you pick up those patients? And, yeah. and if you may be overdoing in those set of patients. If you're operating a first time dislocation, I'm just if, asking. You. Yeah, if the first time traumatic dislocation patient comes with a, a bandaging or something, and then they have, they are coming with a little bit of stiffness in the shoulder, I would let them mobilize. I wouldn't go as immediate. What I meant is the first time this coming to me for an emergency, I treat them around seven days to 10 days. But those who come late with stiffness, it is better to let them mobilize. Take off all the immobilizer. I don't like the immobilizer or strapping because they didn't do anything to the shoulder. So take it off, mobilize them, and then plan the surgery. I think the Raghavir's question also if it's okay, is it better even the first time dislocation to is very, very, very difficult to predict, predict who is going to go for a stiffness. So what he is mentioning is like if you operate on the first time dislocator, if it goes for further stiffness, it will be a problem. Yes. Like how we in the knee joint in the ACL. So always, even if the, the, the criteria to operate is that we want the knee to supple and to get the range of movements full, then we do operate. Sometimes we get in two days, sometimes we get in 20 days. So the, our criteria to do an ACL is like, we want to have a full range of movements to avoid the stiffness. Yeah. So that is the question he's asking. So yes. if you are operating in five to seven days, it is difficult to get back the full range of movements. So that is the, I think that, that is the question. Well, that's the exceptional circumstances when the patient comes in the acute setting. But most of the patients come late and then we do tend to advise for a period of physiotherapy as well as you can also have a clinical assessment to the range of instability as well. When you do it around, when you see them around three to four weeks, uh, that is preferable. Yeah. That's what, that's what we do. We also do. I mean, I uh, we, we do get very, very uh, less people for uh, first time dislocation surgery, even though if you do a counseling, I think the, all the points, what you uh, said is absolutely correct. So we also do the same thing. Uh, I think the uh, conversion rate is a bit late because patient usually goes home, think, come back. By the time they get full range of movements most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Ram, sir, there's a question from me, Dr. Chirag here. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, sir, uh, I did see you uh, do a bank card repair with remplissage in a first time dislocated on one of your slides. Yes. Now, are you very aggressive with your uh, uh, remplissage? It's In not, the, yeah, okay. yeah. That, that particular case was a glenoid fracture, Chiral. Uh, yeah. not, not with the first time dislocator. First time dislocator, you don't need to address the uh, heel sac lesion. Yeah. Uh, because it is mostly impaction, it is not a big dent. It, yeah. uh, uh, mostly. Uh, the one case which I have shown was the glenoid fracture. Whenever there is a glenoid fracture and associated heel sac lesion, uh, I uh, like to put a remplissage anchor to offload the tension on the anterior repair. Yeah, so first time dislocators usually tend not to do a, a, a humeral only, work. Only bank cord repair only is bank. more yes, than sir. sufficient. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Sundar sir and uh, Raghuvir sir, actually Prala sir uh, wants to do the second presentation. He has uh, another meeting. So can we... Uh, yeah. sir, sir, good evening, everyone, sir. Good evening. Yes, sir, sorry, sir. there is a department meeting going on, sir. So we, we know you are the busiest man, man. Don't <laughs> sir, worry. Sir, nothing, sir. Nothing like that. So okay. Yeah. Shall I share yeah. my screen, sir? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ram. It's a wonderful presentation as usual. Thank you. <laughs> Click clear cut points. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Sai Pradeep. Yes, sir. So, present. Agu, uh, next is a Pragla. Okay, this present okay, okay. Okay. Okay.
Sir Raghuvir, sir, shall I present, sir? Yeah, yeah. Prala, you can start. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Sundarajan, sir, IAS, for uh, giving this opportunity to uh, present this case. Uh, so, I uh, am an arthroscopy consultant at Priti Hospital, Madurai. So, we uh, it's a tertiary trauma care center and uh, tertiary care center where we deal across a lot of complex uh, trauma here. So, I would like to share uh, one of my uh, experience of this uh, case here today in this August meeting. So, this is a 32-year-old uh, gentleman who presented with a road traffic accident, uh, polytrauma, head injury. He had a comminuted uh, distal femur uh, fracture type C3.3 and also he had a left-sided PCL avulsion injury. So, so this was his uh, fracture pattern. So, if you can see, uh, it is... Uh, uh, complex, comminuted, multifragmentary, metaphyseal, diaphyseal fragment. And if you can see the lateral femoral condyle, so there was, uh, there are uh, multifragmentary lateral femoral condyle Hofer's fracture. So when we come across these kind of complex injuries, we should also anticipate uh, multi-ligament uh, injuries in these cases. So this was the opposite side. It was a clear cut uh, PCL avulsion, uh, tibial side avulsion fracture. So uh, we, uh, I thank uh, Dr. Sudeep, my colleague, uh, who shared, uh, who operated, in fact, uh, this patient primarily, and uh, he shared his uh, pictures to me. So this fracture was fixed by him, and uh, uh, this was the initial fixation uh, done. So they fixed uh, the entire uh, fracture anatomically, and uh, also they augmented with a medial plate so that he could be mobilized early, uh, early. And this was uh, done for the PCL avulsion fracture. And uh, the patient started uh, mobilizing well and he got a good range of movement. At one year uh, follow-up, this patient was referred to me uh, complaining uh, of uh, knee instability and uh, uh, unsteady gait. So uh, me on examination, I was able to see that there was a tibial sac present. There was a good anteroposterior instability present and also there was an virus instability present in this patient. So now uh, here, how do we uh, go ahead with this uh, case now? So we had a challenges here, how to confirm the diagnosis because there was so much of implant. So we are not sure uh, of getting an MRI done for this patient. So uh, how was the fracture united? How is the alignment of this uh, 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 lower limb? So we wanted to, uh, the concerns were uh, whether uh, to remove the implant, uh, retain the implant or do a partial removal of implant. So what would be the graft options? Also, this patient had some kind of peripheral disvascular limb. So the concern for peroneous graft was also there for me. So uh, we went through the literatures where uh, there is a systemic review by Laparade et al. And also this by uh, Leonard Rocha and all who have uh, stressed upon the stress radiograph for diagnosing the multi-ligament knee injuries. So these are very handy. So we went ahead and we did the stress radiograph for this patient. We did a posterior stress, varus valgus stress, and we could notice that there was significant posterior tibial translation as well as uh, lateral opening on the varus stress. So we did a scanogram as well for this patient, which was almost uh, comparable with the opposite side. So we don't have to deal anything with the alignment issue in this case. So we have to deal only with the multi-ligament knee instability. So now how to deal with the implant? So what we planned was to remove the medial plate and also remove all the uh, screws on the lateral side and uh, uh, so that we could be able to get our ACL and PCL tunnels there and also our LCL tunnel can be placed. So we wanted to create some room for uh, our uh, tunnels here so that uh, we can go ahead with the multi-ligament reconstruction option. So uh, we did a stage one uh, implant removal for this patient. So 
and again we uh, rehabilitated him so that he uh, gains good range of movement at the end of 3 weeks he got a good uh, complete range of movement and then we planned for a multi ligament reconstruction procedure so what are the graft options so we I, we did not want to touch the extensor mechanism uh, as uh, he was already a fractured uh, thing so we opted to take both sides hamstrings we used quadrupled semiti uh, for acl 9 mm and we used uh, semiti and gracilis from the opposite side for pcl which uh, came to around 10 mm gracilis alone with fiber tape was used for plc reconstruction so this is the position uh, i do uh, for the uh, procedure so we use the standard portals and this is uh, the intra uh, op arthroscopic finding so we can see that acl was just lax there was just few fibers of pcl and uh, we i uh, retained those uh, fibers of pcl uh, for anatomical uh, footprint and uh, we just uh, shaved whatever uh, bit of acl needed for visualization of the posterior compartment so we uh, created a transeptal posteromedial portal and uh, uh, got a posteromedial visualization here so we uh, cleared uh, the posterior uh, area and uh, confirm whether we had a good uh, visualization uh, for our pcl tunnel so once uh, i was convinced then i did a, a acl femoral tunnel uh, transportal technique so the knee was flexed uh, in a 110 degrees and uh, we did at the footprint so we were able to uh, get away uh, with all the screws and uh, there was no hindrances in uh, achieving this tunnel then we went ahead and uh, did the pcl tunnel at the footprint of the pcl so i did a single bundle pcl reconstruction here Uh, so uh, outside inside out technique of femoral tunnel was done so anatomical uh, pcl tunnel so there was no problem uh, again in creating getting a pcl femoral tunnel so we went ahead doing uh, tbl pcl and tbl acl tunnel so once all the tunnels were done here so we planned to uh, uh, we then uh, switch the grafts here so we used two different uh, materials so that you don't get uh, confused a thin ethanol wire for uh, acl and uh, we used uh, uh, tight rope two was used for pcl here so it was the graft was rail rolled in so the killer turn was negotiated well here and uh, the graft was flipped and similarly the acl graft was passed here and it was also flipped uh, well and uh, this was the stability uh, which was seen so the crux here is uh, we di we did not uh, fix the uh, pcl and acl graft uh, uh, first we did a plc uh, by doing a modified larson's technique and then uh, later uh, fixed my acl and pcl so this was the final x ray so we i used an additional post uh, to secure my pcl uh, double fixation so this was the outcome this is just two and a half months post op the patient tbl sag is uh, well uh, achieved regained and uh, uh, he is able to uh, uh, do uh, complete active uh, slr and he got reasonably good uh, rom and there is no extensor lag so the, our post op rehabilitation is very important in such cases uh, we have to be uh, careful we use a uh, uh our own like we uh, pcl brace where i keep a bump uh, on the posterior aspect uh, below the tibia uh, to give the lift i use a rom brace up to 3 months uh, and uh, this is the literature which says that knee injuries uh, uh, whenever there are fractures femur there are 30% are associated with the ligament injuries so this is another paper which confirm which have shown that what what are the various types of injuries this is our own paper uh, our floating knee injury classification which is published in injury journal uh, so this is uh, our priti hospital comprehensive classification and if you see we have brought in the modifiers m2 which is an osteo ligamentous disruption which is associated with these fractures which have a greater influence in these injuries this is another paper we are 
working uh, for a publication. So we retrospectively analyzed 595 cases of uh, uh, fractures, of which we have seen that 94 patients had knee instability, and these patients were treated to have a satisfactory outcome. So the take-home message is high index of suspicion of knee instability in such fractures and the assessment of knee stability immediately after stabilization and during follow-up is very important. So we have to do certain tailor-made procedures to uh, get away with in these kind of injuries. So identifying them early and addressing will have a gratifying outcome. Thank you, sir. Wonderful uh, presentation, Dr. Prahlad. Can I can I ask you a question here? Yeah, yeah, please, uh, Chirag. Yeah. So, preoperatively stage one, did you have an MRI? Yeah. Did you have an MRI preoperative stage one? No, 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 Chirag. No, this patient had a, a complex head injury and. Uh, he was a, we never anticipated an instability in such fractures. So I, I doubt anyone would do MRI preoperatively yeah. in such uh, femur fractures. So definitely we had no uh, pre-op MRI, but we so uh, even, only we rely on. Even stage two pre yeah, preoperatively, right. no MRI was available. So it is clearly uh, okay. Clinical two, yes. Yeah, yeah. So how do you count so that's the, the reason I quoted. So uh, we have told the patient that uh, uh, this is again a complex situation here. So we have to uh, take our chances. Uh, so the patient was very cooperative and uh, we also did a very fair job for him now so far. Uh, uh, Pragla, excellent case, excellent case, because uh, sir, we you, know that uh, we we, okay. we we tend to see a lot of uh, complex uh, lower femur fracture, but very rarely you see a patient comes with an instability. That is, that doesn't mean that they are not having a ligament injury. They all have a ligament injury, but most often what happens because they have a single ligament injury, and the patient takes a lot of time to for the fractures to heal well. And by the time the knee goes for stiffness in the last 20 to 30 degrees or 40 degrees, then people tend to leave with that. But uh, because your, uh, your uh, surgeon has done an excellent job and rehabilitated very early, and he got a full range of movements, <laughs> that resulting in this instability. And But uh, at the end, it's an excellent uh, function because he had a full range of movements and also the instability is restored. So that's what happens in the, all these complex injuries. So as your diagnosis improves, your radiological investigations improves and your quality of implant and the surgical techniques improves the trauma cases. So naturally you rehabilitate faster. So that was resulting in the quick healing and mobilization resulting in showing that uh, ligament inception. Otherwise in many cases, they are all unnoticed. Excellent. Uh Excellent result. No, sir. Actually, as you told, sir, rehabilitation is very important, sir. So that is the key, sir. Ab absolutely, absolutely. Because each stage also, when you did every time you made sure that uh, patient had a full range of movement before he entered for a second stage or a, a third stage. So that is important yes, for a, any uh, joint injury, any joint surgery. It is very important. Also, also Dr. Pralad, what is your what is your sequence yeah. of fixation? Yes. As a the frequency of Sequence of fixation of the grafts. Sequence of fixation. Yes, yes, Chirak. So as I already told, uh, I had uh, did arthroscopic uh, uh, passage of the graft, uh, both ACL and PCL. So I first uh, fixed PLC, uh, then I did PCL and then last ACL. Okay, so ACL, tibial tunnel is the last one to be fixed. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, only thing is the PLC, the graft, which we are using for our like, grace list, uh, may not be yes, a sir. strong ligament to restore it. Yes. Um, <clears throat> maybe yes, uh, sir, because, because uh, allograft is not available, you have to use that. Maybe you should have used the peroneus longus for the PCL and uh, opposite. Sir, peroneus, peroneus longus, uh, he had some uh, wound healing problems. Sir. There was some peripheral uh, dysvascular limb. So I did not want to take peroneus, sir. And the opposite side, quadriceps, uh, it was difficult to convince patient to take uh, quadriceps opposite side, sir. So, 
and yeah, also yeah. we did a pcl pcl fixation opposite side sir and that is also doing very good sir yes yeah at, at the end the result the result is very good yeah. considering this uh, complex injury you didn't remove the lateral plate on the second time when you removed uh, it, sir it was it was only one year sir now okay so, so you could I, you could manage the acl tunnel practical. you could manage yes, the acl yeah, okay with the plate because because when you make an anatomical tunnel for the acl they're supposed to come yes, to the mid thigh sometimes we can interfere yes. with the plate so probably you might have gone slightly vertical mm -hmm. to avoid i, I discussed this i discussed this case with tapasvi sir also sir yeah. before uh, so he also suggested you can go like uh, uh, mm -hmm. over the top uh, tunnel sir so as we do for btb Correct. so but i just uh, thought i'll just first put a bead pin if i am able to get away so i i, I proceed yeah, well, yeah what what you what you require is that only that 3.2 or that uh, guide pin to go out yes. because otherwise you don't need to worry about it because you make a like a transtibial technique just go more vertical so that you can easily avoid the plate okay th thanks prala uh, that was a wonderful thank you sir thank, thank you thank you thank you very much sir thank you very much sir. so shall we move on to the next topic uh, sundar sir yes yes sir please you are the boss yeah i think raghuvir sir is raghuvir sir shall we move on Yes. So next uh, next case I think so is uh, been presented by Dr. Sai Pradeep. He is a fellow of arthroscopy in um, Coimbatore Ganga Hospital under uh, Dr. Sundar sir. Uh, he would be presenting a case on uh, lower trapezius transfer for uh, massive rotator cuff tears. Dr. Sai Pradeep. Yes, sir. I am sharing my screen. <laughs> Sai just played. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sundaran sir and uh, Indian Orthoscopy Society for giving me this opportunity to present this case. He is presented with, to us with complaining of pain in right shoulder and difficulty in lifting weights for the last two years. He had history of trauma due to fall on shoulder two years back. On examination, uh, this is the uh, uninvolved limb. And the normal side is having Job's test positive. The external rotation test on involved side and the normal side showing uh, external rotation resistance test positive on the involved side. And uh, on examination, his external rotation lag sign at both 90 degree subduction and 0 degree subduction was positive, indicating massive cup tear involving ter in intraspinatus and uh, teres minor. His plane radiograph showed proximal migration of mild proximal migration of humeral head with uh, no major arthritic changes. And his MRI in kernel section showed supraspinatus and intraspinatus tear with uh, 3.5 cm retraction. Coming to his sagittal section, there is a posto superior cup tear. Mm -hmm. uh, we calculated occupancy ratio by Tomasi et al. method. First, we calculated supraspinatus muscle area. And then supraspinatus fossa area. Calculating the occupancy ratio, it comes as uh, 0.25, which indicates severe atrophy of the involved muscles. Calculating fat infiltration by Gautali et al. method, there is grade 3 fat infiltration in supraspinatus and grade 3 fat infiltration in intraspinatus, and grade 1 fat infiltration in subscapularis, showing GFDA of 2.3. To summarize, till now, our patient is 60 year old male with two years duration of complaints with post traumatic right shoulder pain. With functional limitation, external rotation, and abduction beyond 90 degrees, and uh, Hamada grade one changes in X ray, and uh, with uh, supraspinatus and intraspinatus tear with 3.5 cm retraction, with uh, severe atrophy on uh, MRI, sir. Coming to literature, these are defined as massive cup tears, with, which are defined as uh, rotator cup tears, which are more than 5 cm in diameter, or rotator cup tears involving 2 or 3, two or three tendons. And irreparable means retracted till medial to glenoid edge or muscle atrophy stage 3 on MRI or fat infiltration stage 3 or 4 on CT scan on, on MRI. 
the considering his this this case the treatment options available right now are partial cuff repair using margin convergence and bicep stenotomy and uh, or tendon transfers using lot lot trapezius or latissimus dorsi or superior capsular reconstruction or balloon space implantation or reverse shoulder arthroplasty sir how to decide in, at this point we have to see functional limitation of what the patient is facing sir either he is having partial loss of active elevation or isolated loss of active elevation or isolated loss of rotations or com combination of elevation and rotation sir our patient falls under category partial loss of active elevation and external rotation therefore we took consent for complete repair complete repair or partial repair plus tendon transfer augmentation uh why lower trapezius tendon transfer is preferred in our case is uh, it has its uh, line of action similar to infraspinatus and it is having in phase transfer synergistic function where retraining is not required for stimulating the muscle it restores anterior posterior post couple and it directly improves external rotation elevation sir is that it has its drawbacks it is relatively weak and has short excursion and it requires additional graft for fixing sir on doing diagnostic we have done diagnostic arthroscopy on on doing diagnostic arthroscopy subscapularis was intact and the cuff tear is massive with retraction till glenoid level sir this is the diagnostic arthroscopy picture showing uh, cuff tear which is retracted till the glenoid we release the cuff tissue both subacromially and uh, supralateral release was done this is the video showing the release of cuff both superior and inferior to the cuff so that we can mobilize this is the video showing the mobilizing the cuff how much we can bring back to its normal position here we could see we could bring back infraspinatus to its near normal position so we decided to go ahead first for uh, repair of the cuff we have inserted medial row anchor in the infraspinatus footprint double loaded medial row anchor and then taken bites into infraspinatus and infraspinatus repair was done but the supraspinatus was not this is the video showing infraspinatus repair and then but the supraspinatus we are not able to bring back to its treatment so this is the cuff tear after uh, partial repair of infraspinatus we are not able to bring back the supraspinatus to its footprint so we decided to go ahead for uh, tendon transfer we exposed uh, the incision is at the scapula spine horizontal incision is made the difficult part is identifying the trapezius uh, part sir the trapezius uh, tendon will be triangular in cross section with fibers oriented upwards whereas infraspinatus will be more lateral to it this is the picture showing uh, trapezius tendon graft harvest we prepared for augmentation semi tendinous semi tendinous graft from the same side uh, lower limb and then uh, micro fracturing of the footprint of supraspinatus tendon to increase the biology of the repair and then we have settled the hamstring graft from the trapezius rvs site from uh, and through the anterior portal this is the video showing the settling the hamstring graft anteriorly and then we have fixed first the hamstring in the anterior portion and then taken bites into the hamstring and then fixed using knotless anchor on the lateral row lateral aspect sir this is the video showing fixation of the hamstring graft and then the on the medial side we have fixed this this end of the hamstring graft to the lower trapezius harvested by using modified polar polar tap view tapping view tap view technique and this is the final repair which is stable with rotations and we follow this post operative protocol for the past 6 weeks we immobilize in custom axial rotation brace with uh, keeping uh, limb in 640 to 60, 60 degrees of axial rotation and uh, from 6 to 12 weeks we gradually 
increase the internal rotation and then after three months we'll start internal rotation sir and then from three months to six months four months to six months we'll gradually strengthen the shoulder after six months we'll allow all activities this is the final follow-up of, of our patient is having good action rotation at the end of six months good abduction with no pain and good forward flexion sir. Till now, we have six cases operated with the lower temperature standard transfer. We have used tendoachilles allograft in one, hamstring autograft in four, and peroneus longus in one case for augmentation. No complications till now. We are awaiting for the long term outcome. Coming to review of literature regarding uh, tendon transfers, Gerber et al. in 1998 first described this tendon transfer technique for paralytic shoulders. Uh, Elhasen was the one to popularize with his uh, case report on of lower temperature standard transfer to restore action rotation. This is a systematic review of lower temperature standard transfer technique showing 18 studies which are divided into three categories, four biomechanical studies, seven technique description, and seven clinical studies. Biomechanical studies concluded that lower trapezius standard transfer generally produce values similar to intact cuff during external rotation and abduction. Technique-wise, most of these techniques use Achilles allograft for augmentation, but autografts also generally gaining popularity since they incorporate faster and having a lower inflammatory response. Coming to clinical outcomes, two largest studies, studies still now, one by Elhasen et al. and another by Valenti et al. Both showed improvement in range of motion and functional restoration. This is the latest uh, publication uh, regarding uh, lower trapezius standard transfer published by Elhasen et al. in 2020 in Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. His average follow-up of the patients is 14 months with uh, average age being 52 years. All patients had significant improvement in shoulder external rotation. Two patients had traumatic rupture of transfer. Two patients with uh, Hamada greater than two on X-ray required revision to re reverse shoulder orthoplasty. To conclude, lower temperature standard transfer is a promising technique for massive irreparable cup tears. Careful selection of the patient is important. Studies in large number are required to prove the long-term outcome of this new, new evolving procedure. Our indications for LTT include uh, external rotation lag sign positive with active elevation, preferably more than 60 degrees, involving two or more tendons, retracted patty stage three, or grade three in fatty infiltration or revision cup repairs. Thank you, sir. Excellent presentation, uh, Dr. Sai Pradeep. Thank you, sir. Yeah, if I may ask, why would you prefer this over uh, latissimus dorsi transfer? Sir, lower trapezius has uh, inline action with uh, infraspinatus, sir. It has its uh, fibers oriented in, in the line of infraspinatus. And it is synergy, and uh, most of the studies showed synergistic action in relation to infrastructure. Lattice must also has its vector downward and down abnormal vector when compared to infrastructure. Yeah. So better to prefer lattice must dorsal uh, lower pages. Good. Okay. good, good presentation, uh, Soy. I think yeah. I totally totally agree with that uh, the difference between lattice must dorsi, which is essentially a depressor, whereas yes. your uh, lower trapezius is a uh, external rotator gives power to the shoulder. Excellent results. Now, my question is, how do you choose? Because you have shown allograft, hamstrings, peroneus longus. How do you choose among this graft? Which one you found it better? Maybe Sundar can also. also. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> our, no, no, our series is very, very uh, small. Uh, as we see, we are doing only, for, only yeah. for the last one year. So, when he started, first case, I started with the tendochilus graft because uh, because LS and paper all with the TA yes. allograft. So, we had that allograft, so we used on the first case. Mm. So, what happened that further cases, we don't, we didn't have that graft, uh, tendochilus allograft, we, didn't, we couldn't get it at all. Then we thought, okay, better to go with the autograft. That's why we moved on to the autograft with the hamstring. So, so still we, it's very, very small series to see the difference between these, uh, all of the things. But we found that even though the hamstring, we, we, we doubled it, you have a very good uh, a bulky graft to which occupies the entire uh, entire uh, footprint. When you use the aloe graft, naturally we had to trim it. You had to take it, take off half of the graft, you had to waste it because it otherwise would be too bulky to put it inside the uh, footprint, shoulder. uh, shoulders, inside the shoulder. So that's why we moved on to more of auto, autographs nowadays. Thank you. Sundar, yes, sir. if we compare to hamstring and peroneus, which one you prefer now? Now you have taken both 
Yeah, because now I prefer more of Peronius because the last case was the Peronius. The previous case were all a hamstring graft. Yeah, now you previously a longer extension. Yeah, long. Ah, uh, yeah, correct. And previously, I was also very hesitant to Peronius even in the knee joint. You know that as a foot and ankle surgeon, I was very afraid. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> once people started using it, then I also started using you now Peronius longus in the knee joint. Mm -hmm. Then we thought we were going to use the Peronius longus for the. Um, uh, lattice mustache transfer also. So the only the last case was the peronis longus. The in between four cases were the hamstring graft. So hope you use more peronis longus. Try to produce some paper if possible <laughs> before somebody does. Sai, so unshare screen. Any other questions? In this case, uh, what you showed, the biceps was intact, very well. That you showed. Like, I, I don't think biceps was intact because it's a... Because I couldn't see the video of this. I couldn't see the biceps. Yeah, it, biceps was not there because very chronically retracted. It's a two years duration. Chronically retracted medial to the glenoid. So there was no biceps. Otherwise, uh, even the biceps, SCR also is a possibility. The yeah, possibility is that the thing is here, the, even the infraspinatus is not completely restored. What he says that uh, uh, the footprint of infraspinatus was restored, but what we could do, the infraspinatus also is not a complete repair. You know, you know, it's very chronically retracted. That was also only partial repair was done. That's why we thought to do a tendon transfer for the uh, additional uh, support. Um, so here, SCR is not a, uh, it's a, not a good option because here problem is the more of external uh, uh, rotation lag rather than the active elevation. He has got an active elevation. So only last 30 degrees is the problem. So his main problem is the external rotation. He is a boatman in a Maldives patient. So he wants yeah, the strength of the external rotation. That's why he preferred a trapezium. Yes, he is ideal. I think he's around 60, but he looks like a 50 only. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's 60 years old. Yes. They are all very hardworking guys in Maldives. You know? They are all working in the boats and resorts. So it's ideal case. Yeah, ideal it's, case. Uh, it's correct that uh, SCR will give you pain relief, but not power to external rotation. Yeah, it give okay. it. Tendon transfer will provide the power. power. So we, we know that SCR is a, just a depressor. Hopefully, if it heals well, it can work as a depressor. Yes. So that can help in elevation, but uh, uh, tendon transfers definitely gives air to the more the, movements and some strength. Sir, there are two questions. Sir, Sundar, sir. Yes. Yeah, sir, all these, uh, uh, you have done the pre-operative planning and prepared the um, lower limb and also, or it's an intraoperative decision to do tendon transfer, sir? No, we prepare, we prepare. Uh, uh, after these cases, actually, we used to prepare a lot of cases, but uh, we didn't need to do all this, all those cases because you get enthusiast with any chronic case. If you see, okay, this patient may require a transfer, but uh, many times we could do the repair very well. So the but we prepare generally after this case after this uh, started doing the trapezius we usually I uh, usually prepare the leg also so that if necessary we can do it. No, that is the sir because uh, in your presentation Sai was telling so he was not able to pull the supraspinatus and then, then you thought of doing this transfer. No, no, no this, so, it's all pre-planned, pre pre-planned. Okay, okay. We know that it is a two years old. We know that it's a medial to clean night. We know that fat infiltration is three. It's very, very rare to get, very difficult to get back to the uh, footprint. Uh, even though if we could repair, I know that we can repair only a partial infraspinatus, which normally we do in all chronic cases. So we planned for a trapezius transfer, we prepared all. Thank you, sir. There are two questions in the chat box, sir. Yeah. What is the uh, one clinical radiological feature we see before deciding the transfer between upper transvisal lattice must dorsi in irreparable? I think the more of a, a clinical judgment, the people tend to have a more loss of elevation. The, I think the, pref the preferred LD is better um, because the ducts has a more depressor and getting more elevation. The guys who has got a more than 60 degrees of elevation who loses, a sexual, who has doesn't have a External, external, external rotation with the lag, they do better with the uh, lower trapezius transfer. And uh, do you have a open the fascia of the transpend to pass the graft to sub subacromial space or over the fascia? 
Now we don't open the any fascia of the infraspinatus. Just we take through the harvest site. We take it through over the infraspinatus fascia and uh, put it in the footprint. Footprint. What we do that we do the partial repair of the infraspinatus. We keep the medial anchor threads intact so that when we put the uh, graft over there, then we bring that all the medial threads of the infraspinatus repair that will act as a big good coverage for the footprint to sit in the footprint. Uh, if there is no further questions, uh, shall we close? I take this opportunity to thank Raghu and uh, Chirag for moderating this session. And uh, thanks, Ram, for the excellent uh, presentation. And also, Sai and Pragalad is a very complex case. It's a wonderful result. Uh, keep uh, presenting, Pragalad. I think it's the second case thank or third you, case? Ah, yes, sir. Third, third case. Yeah. So, Pragalad, Pragalad, Pragalad. I think it's a third case. Thank Regular you, Pragla. customer. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Pragla. you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Uh, good Thank night. You. Bye.